All right, welcome back from lunch, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed PyCon. I know I have. Looking forward to speaking to you all about Rap Sheets. And at Thingst, we are heavily a Python shop. Oh. <laughs> I'll introduce myself, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, uh, welcome everybody uh, to this session. You can see that the speaker is ready to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but well, let's introduce him properly. Yeah, you are ready to go. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, Kegan Javis. He's going to talk on the continuous HTTP and DNS monitoring. Okay, fire on. Okay, so yeah, as I said, welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, really looking forward to speaking to you all about rap sheets. At Things, we are heavily a Python shop, and this thing that we're talking about today is built in Python, as is our main product. So, who am I? My name's Keegan Jarvis. I'm the DevOps at Things Applied Research. Um, I'm also Cape Town, uh, B-Sides Cape Town organizer, as well as the OWASP Cape Town co-head. So, the main sections we're gonna be covering today are some of the issues that we were having with monitoring. I'll then give an explanation of our environment, and we'll finally introduce Rap Sheets and what we built. So what are we trying to avoid through all of this? Well, we want to get better monitoring of our infrastructure. We run a service called Canary. Canary involves thousands of devices deployed in different customer networks around the world. These communicate to a per-customer console running in AWS. The devices communicate over DNS to their consoles. Our CTO, Mark, spoke about this at PyCon last year. The customers are then able to manage their canaries on an online console, which is done via web UI across HTTPS. The web server that we're running there mostly just proxies onto an application server. So this is definitely what we want to avoid completely. Our, we don't want customers mailing in and telling us that their console is down or that our services aren't working correctly. What that means is we need to, more monitoring on these consoles. So we know that all these services are out there that do web and DNS monitoring, but the question is why are we reinventing from these products? Well, look, we investigated these, but we wanted really quick feedback and we couldn't get any of these to do exactly what we wanted. It comes down to our needs weren't fulfilled with these existing systems. We need quickness as well as a high degree of control. The crux of what, we re what this really comes down to is ensuring that our services are up on each customer console. So all the services that we are running per customer console are a DNS service that is a custom designed DNS server which is capable of communicating with the birds, an Nginx web server for handling secure connections, which, as I mentioned, mostly proxies onto a USG application server. We also offer another service for our clients called Canary Tokens, which requires their own DNS server and application server. These all combine and run on a single EC2 instance. But we have a unique instance per customer with hundreds of customers. So we know AWS is not infallible. There have been big news stories about data center outages and we've constantly seen EC2 instance failures on our side. We also all know that the internet is really just a series of tubes. So besides for the failures in AWS, we also need to know if any network paths are failing. When it comes to using public DNS, we're reliant on DNS services that we have no control over. There are thousands of these DNS root name servers that exist, and this picture just covers the top level of DNS servers. Any of these name servers could cause us issues. And how do we normally look out for issues? We do monitoring, and for monitoring, we go with dashboards. You've probably all seen dashboards like this. To us, this is awful. We don't know what we should be looking at, this gives a whole lot of information, but action isn't obvious. All this is is just a flood of information. But this is not something new. This is seen in the medical and aerospace industries before. There's a phenomenon well known to the medical industry. The cause of it is when patients are hooked up to too many machines. All these machines are constantly beeping and firing off alerts. This constant alerting state leads to alarm deafness for the medical staff. But 
alarm deafness affects engineers as well. So there's this great, there's this talk by Eric Brandwine from AWS. This really is a great talk and you should totally check it out. I'm just going to be giving you a super quick Cliff Notes version of it. He talks about alarm deafness. He also talks about the problem with threshold based measurements. So if you're measuring something that accumulatively occurs and you set a threshold on that number, then when those metrics come up or down, um, it's not really clear whether these really matter. Luckily, Eric gives us a great way to avoid this case and that is to rather track things you aren't expecting. Things that should be a zero measurement. So in our case, we never want to see any DNS lookup errors. When we see this graph at non-zero, we know the immediate response is that this is actionable. But this only works if the goal for the team is to drive the measurement to zero and keep it there. Another benefit of when all the graphs are zero-based, you can just pile them all onto one set of axes because any deviation from zero is all that's needed. So to wrap this section up, we have hundreds of customers. Each has their own DNS and HTTP service that needs to be running at all times. We don't just want a generic dashboard. We want a dashboard that is actionable. And like with our customers using our Canary product, we want to know when it matters. So now I'm going to jump into what kind of DNS monitoring we require. Just want to reiterate, this DNS is how our devices connect. If the DNS queries sent from the birds to the consoles were not being processed throughout the public DNS infrastructure correctly, the birds would not be able to communicate with, the, communicate with their consoles. And without the consoles receiving the messages from the birds, alerts can come in too late. And because it's public DNS, we therefore rely on third parties. So what are some of the known causes of DNS query failures we've seen? Well, these are the things that we're looking out for. The servers could be down because of some buggy code pushed to the consoles. Our domains could be blacklisted by third parties, or the AWS instance could have gone into recovery mode. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page, this is what happens in basic DNS. It takes a host name and returns an IP. But DNS also has other re query record types. I'm just going to jump into terminal now quickly, and give you a quick demo. It's going to run a simple host command against canary.tools, which is our main website, and you'll see Simply, it just returns an IP address there for us. But as I mentioned, there are other types of uh, DNS queries that uh, exist. The one we're mostly interested in is the text type query. So what I'm going to be running here is host uh, specifying that we want a text type query. Um, we're going to be running this against one of our custom DNS implementations, which is written to specifically respond to specific test queries, such as a ping, which is basically showing rep, uh, representing how a typical ICMP ping behaves. So if I were to run this here, you'll see the text that it comes back in the quotes there is exactly what we sent. And if I were to run it again with some random data included before the ping, you'll see inside the quotes there is that extra random data that I included. So to summarize all the DNS queries, sorry, to summarize all the DNS queries we need, we need three A queries, uh, which because we have three separate services relying on their own unique IP address, and one text type query, which is essential for the bird's communications. That's therefore four separate uh, queries per customer. As we showed earlier, uh, there are different DNS providers which could be used if customers have birds in different physical locations. The networks that the birds live in may use different service providers. There have been times where one of the large service providers, such as OpenDNS, blocked our domains. This led to a large-scale outage for us and a good chunk of birds were then unable to communicate with their consoles. So that brings us to the end of this DNS monitoring section. Just want to wrap it up. We showed you that we're reliant on many different DNS queries. DNS is our main communication channel for the birds and we have been blocked before by DNS service providers. So we've now talked DNS. Let's get into the HTTP channel that we need to monitor. So we need to monitor that our consoles are reachable using HTTPS. How? Well, it's trivial. I'm just going to jump into the terminal again here. And I'm going to run a simple curl command against one of our staging consoles. Uh, we run curl with uh, the minus L flag to follow all redirects. And what you see comes through here is just a whole bunch of JavaScript and HTML. Um, your browser would obviously be able to process this uh, HTML and JavaScript and display it uh, correctly. And yeah, just like with the host command that we ran before, um, this just won't scale for our use cases. 
It's really important to us that these consoles are available to our customers. Consoles have an API that the customers access. There are two kinds of failures we've seen in the past that affects our HTTPS services. The issue could be a bug with our service, but consoles are also accessed via a browser. And modern browsers are smart and consult third-party blacklists for URLs before navigating there. So it could be a problem with our service, or it could be a, a filter that is blocking access to our URLs. These are the main suspects of third-party blacklists that we want to check our URLs against. They are Google's Safe Browsing, Cisco's Talos, and VirusTotal. So to quickly summarize all the HTTP requests that we need to make, we need three simple GET requests against all of our HTTP services that we have, um, and then two requests against third-party service APIs. So then to wrap this entire HTTP monitoring section up, we showed you how to use a simple curl request, a curl request to see if our consoles are available, and we covered known HTTP failures, whether they're from us or from third-party blacklists. So with all these requests and queries covered for just a single customer, we obviously need this to scale to cover all our customers. So we have those four DNS queries we spoke about, those five HTTPS requests, and those 800 or so customers that we have. That leads to over 7,000 tests that we need to perform. Just to be clear, we have those 7,000 uh, tests that we can run at one point in time that would tell us the overall health of our uh, infrastructure, but that won't help us in the future. So how often should we do it? Should we do it like days, weeks, months intervals? Or should we just throw all 7,000 tests into a while true that repeats uh, the, the test straight away until once they've completed the, the last time? So there's a real trade-off here between not flooding our services and the third-party services while also being uh, aware of failures early on. So we really needed to find that balance. So we ended up on deciding on running all 7,000 tests every 90 seconds. So to wrap up this entire monitoring section we just covered, um, we covered the DNS monitoring, the HTTP monitoring, and we showed you what type of scale is required for our overall monitoring. So without further ado, introducing RapSheet. We call it RapSheet because we envision this monitoring system to build up a list of crimes for all our endpoints. This is the total architecture that we use for RapSheet. So to get a good looking dashboard, we start with Grafana. Grafana makes use of an influx time series database. We also have a Flask web server to run an API so that we can programmatically alter the test performed. We're using a SQL Lite database for st storing all the endpoints that we are going to be testing. Um, what is Magnum, you may ask? Well, we mentioned wanting to build up a list of crimes. And who does that? Why, well, detective, of course. And what better detective than Magnum PR? So what exactly is Magnum? Magnum is an asynchronous process that manages everything for us. Magnum is pretty much just a loop that runs over all our plugins. Individual plugins exist for all the, all the third-party services we have discussed. Magnum is designed, to be, is designed to be able to pull out and add new plugins whenever the need arises. To handle the scale, we need to go asynchronous. Therefore, Magnum makes use of Python 3 async IO library. Async relies on being able to fire off some task and decide that while you don't have the results of that task, you are better off doing some other, other work instead of waiting. This rarely leads itself to network applications, as most networks spend a long time waiting between firing off the call and receiving the response from the other node in the network. The async IO based libraries that we really make use of are AIO DNS and AIO HTTP. I'm going to give you a quick run through of how these libraries are used. So, what we have here is a really simple DNS client using AIO DNS. Just to, it's just here to show you an example of what it's going to do. This small script will perform five DNS queries asynchronously. The thing to watch out for is that unlike the host commands we ran earlier that uh, waits for the commands to return, uh, what happens here is that five qu queries will be in flight at once. So let's just walk through the code quickly. So we start off with importing the async IO library. Next, the AIO DNS library that we're going to be using. To include some randomness in our ping response, we get the random library and for string handling, the string library. We also want to do a little bit of uh, error handling for any DNS queries that fail. Next, we get that uh, main async IO event loop that we're going to be uh, kicking, using to run everything. From there, we create a resolver object. And from here, then we create a query. Um, an async type uh, 
type of function called query. This query is able to take in a host name and a query type. To start off this function, we're going to be printing off as it starts, so you get a good illustration of what's happening. Um, then we kick off the actual query itself, send it off, and await the, the response. Once the response has come back, um, we set that to a variable and print out the results of what has come back. So we need to build up a whole a few a list of coroutines that we're going to be uh, running against. So we just have a simple for loop of five times here. Here we're just making a random string that we're going to be uh, putting in front of the ping request. Um, we create one single coroutine using that uh, query function that we spoke about before. In there we post the iteration number, the random string we spoke about, and um, which uh, query type, which is the txt type. From there, we append that single coroutine we just made onto the list of coroutines. Finally, at the end here, we use the async.io.wait command to gather all those coroutines together and tell the async.io loop to run all those coroutines until complete. So jumping into the terminal here quickly, just want to show you how that looks. What I do, I'm just going to run dns.py, which is that exact um, query uh, script that we just ran through. If I run it, you see, because of the async nature, it does not do everything in the exact order that you would think that you thought like that it was specified in. Um, and returning at the end also comes through in a different uh, order. That's 100% due to just randomness in the networks that between us and the DNS server that we're going to. If I were to run it again, you'd see another completely different order would happen. So next we have a simple demo using the AIO HTTP library. Here we will be, be performing a simple HTTP GET request against three of our staging consoles. When we run this, remember to look out for all the con requests being in flight at one point in time. They will return in a different order than what they were run in, in, mo in most times, most of the time, due to the async nature of the script. So again, we start off with the async IO library, next the AIO HTTP library that we're going to be using. We get that event loop that we needed again um, from the previous script. This time we, we make a requesting uh, async function that is able to return a coroutine. Um, this time it's called requesting. Again, we start off by printing, letting so we give a good illustration of when this uh, function starts. From here, we create a client session object, and with that session object, we perform a get request. Once that get request returns a response, we just save the, the HTTP response code um, of that request and print it out. So here, we just have a simple list of uh, staging consoles that we're going to be performing the request against. And here we do it a little bit differently, how we gather all the coroutines. We just use list comprehension on that above list to uh, perform that requesting um, function against each URL. And we gather them again using the async.io.wait function. At the end, we pass all those coroutines, gathered co weighted coroutines into the, the loop and tell them to run until complete. So we're going to drop into the terminal for the last time here. And if I run HTTP, the HTTP demo that we have here, you'll see it starts all the requests against those, and they come back at different times. Um, again, coming back in a different order than what they were fired off in. That's just the async nature of what's happening here. So now that we're collecting this data, we also want to make use of this data. The one way we do this uh, is to display it in the office using Grafana. What's nice about this uh, dashboard is that it's in contrast to that first dashboard that we showed you, which was just a flood of information. When we see green on this dashboard at a simple glance, we know we don't need to look at it again. Now, if something goes wrong, that red panel stands out like a sore thumb, and we know we have to check it out. Here's just a quick look of how we have it projected up in the office. It's projected in the main thoroughfare, so anyone walking to and from the office facilities can get a good look at it. I just want to reiterate that it's not, that it's not Grafana performing the checks. Grafana is only being used for displaying. The second way that we use this data is to tie it into our Slack. That way, the ops team can get a quick heads up. The zero-based paradigm isn't just using Grafana, but also in Slack. So this Slack channel is empty most of the time. Messages are only in this channel when anything is in an, in an alerting state. And once Rapshi performs that test again and the test pass, passes, then the messages are deleted from the channel and we're back to an empty channel. 
We also want to be able to throw up other metrics from other places in our infrastructure. We obviously only want the one dashboard. Therefore, we want to be able to add other alerts to our dashboard. So as an example, we rely on salt. Therefore, we want to be able to have a panel that is particular to any salt issues that we may be experiencing. Therefore, that Flask web server has an API endpoint for us to add new measurements onto our dashboard. I need to be clear, it isn't Magnum that's performing these checks. Magnum is just responsible for the DNS and HTTP, HTTPS tests. So where do we host rap sheets? Well, we already spoke about the fallibility of AWS. So we want our monitoring system to be completely decoupled from our main AWS infrastructure. So we therefore host rap sheet at a far, a far smaller cloud service provider. So I just want to touch on the rates that we've been able to achieve with rap sheets. What do we mean by full rates? Well, back on that slide where we spoke about intervals, uh, we discussed the trade-offs and how, how best to test. We decided that doing the full range of tests every 90 seconds. So here are some of the stats that we got out. We've seen that some of the providers don't allow that rate, and so we had to pull back. As you can see, some strange things happen with both Google and our host DNS services that are completely out of our control. So to wrap this last section up, we covered Rap Sheets architecture. The async IO libraries uh, we have used to ensure scale were demoed. Um, uh, we showed we showed you how we're displaying the alerts as well on a, uh, we showed you how we're displaying the alerts on a dashboard as well as in our Slack channel. We also covered the ability uh, for external services to create dashboard panels separate from Magnum, uh, and we finished it up with RapSheet's hosting location and the achieved rates. So look, we know RapSheet is not for everyone. This is for you if you need lots of DNS and HTTP monitoring in short periods of time. So to get you started. We're hosting um, all the Docker images on Docker Hub. It's a simple config file for you to set up. You may, may need a, yeah, you do need a, a few uh, API keys, mostly for Google Safe Browsing. Um, you fire up those images, and yeah, once it's up, you can just uh, start adding suspects and their targeted URLs to the system. So yeah, to close this out, we felt that existing monitoring systems solutions did not work for us, and we want to avoid alarm deafness. We learned from Eric Brandwine that the best way to do this is by using zero-based graphs. RapSheet was our solution to the presenter problem, and we've been loving it for the last few months. Also, just quickly, B-Sides Cape Town is happening December 7th. We have organized some great speakers this year, and you should totally come check it out. Um, so I'm ready for questions now, but as an aside, if you're a student looking for a summer job, then please check out our internship opportunity at the link below. Okay, thank you. So it's quest of time. Uh, thanks very much. Awesome speech. Um, I saw the speech last year by your CTO um, explaining how you use DNS. Obviously, it's a very innovative way of, of using DNS for monitoring. Um, my question is, when you have a DNS issue, so Cloudflare or goes down, what do you do? Do you just kind of wait it out, or? No, we reach out to their supports and yeah, um, technicians over there that we have contacts with. So yeah, that, okay. exactly what happened with the uh, Open DNS. When we had that outage, we reached out to them. It was about a few hours until their technicians dove in and unblocked us. Cool, thanks. Okay. Our questions? Hey, great talk, thanks. Um, how do you see the scaling? Let's say you get a thousand new customers and you've got a thousand new consoles. I'm pretty confident in it, in it as it is. Like just the way we've included um, the, yeah, just the way it's completely based on the async IO uh, library. I've taken, done a few stress tests on it and just doubled the size of that SQL database and ran it and it seemed to run just fine. But yeah, if it becomes, Thousands and thousands I haven't done that level yet, but I'm pretty confident in it. I think the slight reservation I have is for that Slack channel posting, because we often hit uh, Slack's rate limits for posting to the messages and editing the messages. Okay. We still have time for one or two more questions. If
Uh, sorry, it's slightly unrelated to your talk, though. Uh, the internship, what kind of level do you expect the people to apply for? I might have somebody in mind. Sorry, Nick knows you. more than me here. Uh, any current students? Cur current comp size students? Cool. Thanks. Okay. Um, and you guys do a lot of Python? Yes, we're mostly a Python shop. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. And I'll wrap up. Okay. Back to considering what happens if you get a thousand new customers. Um, you mentioned you had some limits on the rates of data that you could get through various DNA services. Yes. In the event of a sudden doubling of your customer base, would that require you to lower the frequency of your alerts? Yes, definitely. Um, so RAPSHI is completely configurable to what, yeah, we can just set in that config file that we have what rates we choose against those uh, services. So if now we were doubling against Google's DNS, which is the one that's rate lim limiting us the most, then we would just halve that again and yeah, go ahead half that rate limit half that rate again. Okay, let's give uh, Kega another round of applause.